Welcome to the Clear Brand Academy podcast, where we take the mystery out of marketing and help you get more leads and sales with a clear brand and proven marketing tactics. I'm your host, Alexander Toth. Today, I am joined by our business development manager, Josh Ramsey. Again, Josh uh, has helped to build out our growth accelerator programs. He is the community manager for Clear Brand Academy, Clear Brand Amplify. And today, we are going to have an excellent conversation about advertising. How does advertising actually work? What is the purpose? What is the difference between advertising that gets results and advertising that doesn't? Mm -hmm. Who should we be targeting? We're going to cover all of these in the conversation today and more. So if you're curious about advertising, this is the episode to be listening to. Welcome, Josh. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, super happy to be here. Super interested in this topic and where it's going to take us today. So I think it's so interesting that we're entering this uh, this new age of marketing, which is very mm -hmm. scientific. And of course, at Clearbrand, we've been uh, obsessed about data-driven marketing for a while now. But it's wonderful to to start looking at all these practices, these things that we do and we're told to do and we assume we have to do and uh, really digging into why. Why are we doing that? So that's a wonderful place to start. So yep. what is advertising and why do we have to do it? Um, big question. And yeah. uh, a few great uh, ways to look at it today. So I think it starts with one of the laws of marketing, which is the 95-5 law. Mm -hmm. The idea here is that at any given moment, less than 5% of people in your market, so that means people who might buy from you one day, less than 5% of them are ready to buy today. So last week we talked about availability. And for those 5%, who are ready to buy today, who mm -hmm. are looking for what you sell, we want to be available. Yeah. We want to make sure that you're able to be found, you're able to be purchased wherever those people are looking. Yeah. So that's kind of seamless. A, yeah. Seamless, right. No friction from the, not, not just on your website. People talk about friction on websites, but we're talking friction from the moment that people think about buying from you mm -hmm. all the way till they've completed that purchase. So that yep. includes the process of finding, evaluating, yep purchasing and we got so a that's whole, last week's podcast yeah we got a whole podcast there we're not going to dive into too much detail so check that right. one out from last week but availability is foundational for any good marketing strategy yeah. so go back and listen to that if you haven't already but this law of 95.5 what does this mean for the other 95 percent of people who are not going to buy majority. today yeah they're probably not going to buy this week yeah what do we do with them yeah, and depending on the product and category, I mean, it could be if it's a house, it's once in 10 years. If it's a car, maybe it's once in five years. If it's a cell phone, right. once in two years. Um, yeah, so, so this so what's can what's happening be... in between these purchase moments. Exactly. And even yeah. for brands that get bought more frequently, like Coca-Cola, what the research mm -hmm. shows is a lot of revenue, average is 50% of revenue for these companies, comes from people who rarely buy. Even with something yeah. like a can of Coke, where you're going to buy it yeah. more often. Yeah. 50% of revenue comes from people who rarely buy, right? With Coca-Cola, it's specifically they buy one or two, maybe three times per year. Yeah. Three cans, not not like big, was, massive packs, but I, cans. I was a bit shocked to find that out. You know, I try to be healthy. I try to think of myself as a, as a healthy person, you know, not buying these sugary caffeinated drinks and then turns yeah. out i'm uh, i'm part of the 50 percent of uh, right coke's revenue yeah right? if you buy if you buy once yeah. a year yeah you are contributing it. to 50 percent of coke Hill's revenue it's amazing yeah so this is where advertising comes in right so if we're talking about coca-cola we zoom in to them for a second mm -hmm. most of their customers so 50 percent of the revenue comes from 80 percent of their customers who have this yeah. really rare buying frequency yeah so they're, they're not buying today. They're not going to buy tomorrow. Yeah. They're not going to buy next week. Yeah. They might buy in six months. Yeah. And this is where advertising comes in. You see, availability is for the folks who are looking to buy today. But reach and advertising and getting in front of people, mm -hmm. well, that's for the 95% who aren't buying today. Mm -hmm. If we think about that 5%, they go to buy today. Your competition is advertising. And so if your competition has been getting in front of these people and you haven't, you're already starting off behind. 
So even if you're available, they might already have a slight preference for your competition simply because they've been seeing advertising. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that buying moment, all the options don't pop up right in front of you. You kind of, you arrive in that buying moment and something comes to mind Mm -hmm. and you go, Oh yeah, that's, that's it. Great. Uh, I know what it does. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. That's going to be great. I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. You're thinking about who have I bought before? Who have I liked? Who I heard about? Right. And this is also some of the myth of loyalty comes from this loyalty exists but it's based on our survival. So mostly it's because we don't want to have to go and reevaluate everyone all the time. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking about who have I seen before? We're thinking about who have I bought before? Mm -hmm. And we don't want to have to make a fresh decision. Yeah. And so that's where this like myth of loyalty comes about. Yeah. You know, you, you said the word there survival, right? And I think this is great because this is where the science of kind of the mythical advertising beast is now hitting Mm -hmm. survival. Now, hold on. That's something that we can quantify. That's something. How does the brain work? How much energy does it take to review options? Um, How much time do I have to make these options? And I need to be optimized for that. And then I'm going to survive more efficiently. So in terms of making those decisions, this is where the advertising comes in and helps us make a decision because it does this kind of pre-processing before the time comes in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So if we're getting in front of people who aren't going to buy today and they're not going to buy next week, they're maybe going to buy in a month, probably more like six months or depending on what you sell, even further out from that. If that's what we're doing with advertising, then how exactly do we go about that is this next question. Yeah. So if we imagine this ad that somebody sees and then it's a certain amount of time later that they're actually purchasing Mm -hmm. and we're not in front of them at that moment necessarily. What we're really talking about with advertising is memories. Yeah. So we want to be building yeah. memories so that when the buying happens, we're an option. Yeah. And that through line, you know, I taking it back to survive survival, you know, that makes sense to me, right? You, you know, you arrive at a, a berry bush, you got to choose which berries you're going to eat. And then mm-hmm. you've got this memory of, hold on, there was that other guy that chose the red ones and he, he was sick for a couple of weeks. And that memory, right. but that memory doesn't come to mind when you're down, you know, fishing in the river. That's only when you're in front of the berries, when you're trying to make this decision. Mm-hmm. So there's something that connects the decision process right then into this, this past, this, all these memories and associations. And I think that is, is a really interesting idea to unpack. Yeah. So we're going to talk about memories, but even before we get into memories, there's some interesting research that shows for people who see an ad, even if they don't remember seeing the ad, Mm -hmm. they have a slight preference for the brand that they saw. And I think that this berries thing is, is a good picture of why if we are familiar with something, we're more likely to feel that this thing's safe. Yeah. You know, if, we're, if we have all these berries in front of us and some of these berries are poisonous. I mean, most plants are poisonous. Yeah. So it absolutely makes sense that built into our humanity, built into, I mean, all animals that eat things, mm-hmm. it makes sense that we would have this familiarity. Association. This association, uh, familiarity. right? These memories. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. going to, I am going to get that one and not this other one. Yeah. I think, I think that that also says something about the type of berries, they got to be distinguishable, right? They got to be distinct. Mm-hmm. You got to know which berry is which berry. So that's where mistakes happen, right? And learning in the tribe or whatever the context is where, hold on, this berry's got four leaves, but it's the five leaf berry of the same kind that still a baddie, you know? Mm-hmm. So there has to be, and if we translate that now, and, and, you know, I say this just humbly as someone that's made this mistake in my own entrepreneurial journey where mm-hmm. you're, you're putting out different berries. You know, it's not the same berry if, if you if you take the metaphor where we're trying to build memories associated to this purchase moment or this choice yeah. moment, but we're not consistent and we're not unique. So we're not, people don't even know that we are who we say we are. Right. Right. There's no reason to choose that one because let, let's, and let's, let's get a little bit more specific here. So let's say that somebody's advertising yeah, and they've run whatever kind of ad billboards or Facebook ads or something. And each ad had a different design from the previous ads. There's no recognizability here. So somebody Mm -hmm. doesn't know that they've seen that ad before. It has not built memories and they get to go, Mm -hmm. they get to buy. And even if they saw 10 ads, but they can't, it doesn't look like the 
the product that they're about to buy, it hasn't created any memories. It hasn't created any familiarity. And so the buying decision is as if there was no advertising. Yeah. Yeah. There's On the no flip side of things. Being brought to that, to that moment of purchase. Yeah. Right. That decision moment. Yeah. And on the flip side, even if you, you have run ads and they've been consistent, but they are not distinguishable, they're not recognizable, mm-hmm. you have the same problem. It hasn't necessarily been building memories with your brand, mm-hmm. right? So one of the, one of the questions we, we ask when we're designing something is, is this recognizable? Yeah. If we showed this little asset here, maybe it's the symbol with the colors and, and, and an icon or something. Is this going to trigger memories of a competitor's brand? Because mm-hmm. if, if mm-hmm. A, a bad logo might do that, it's yeah. not necessarily going to look like your brand. Yeah. It might look like your competitor's brand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it might look like a brand in a totally different industry, right? Yeah. If you're using, let's say, camouflage, for example, camouflage is widely associated with either the military or hunting. So if you have this camo, coloring on some kind of a coffee, uh, coffee right? <laughs> yeah. There's a potential that you're not, if somebody just sees the camo mm-hmm. and maybe the name of your company, they're not going to have any clue that you sell coffee. Yeah. You're, you're reinforcing memories with hunting in yeah. the military. Yeah. So we want to be unique and recognizable in our designs. So as we're going about creating a, a brand, we've got to be measuring the uniqueness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and this can be done internally within your team. This can also be done in surveys. There's these there's a lot of online surveys these days that allow you to do this. You can upload an image or something and then people vote on it. Yep. And so you can, you, you would not want to just have people vote on whether they like it or not. You would, you would want to find one of these survey things that basically could measure this uniqueness, right? Have you, you might want to ask something like, have you seen another brand that looks similar to this, right? And you're looking for a lot of notes. This is, this is very unique. Yeah. Does this remind you of anything that you've seen recently? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and this can be hard because a lot of us have created a brand that isn't very unique. Sometimes Mm -hmm. we get a client come in and they just barely paid somebody else to do their logo and it's not unique at all. Yeah. And that's a tough conversation, but it's a conversation we got to have because in five years or even in one year, if your brand's not unique, you're going to be feeling the pain. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, and, that's uh, tough. Yeah. It reminds me of you guys. Um, before I joined the team, uh, you ran a, a great podcast with uh, Byron, our uh, lead designer on mm-hmm. unique branding or, or design. And I think that's a big part of what we're talking about here. So definitely check out that podcast. It'll be on, on the same channel if you want more yeah. detail on that. Yeah. So just to bring this kind of back to the, the overall focus of the podcast today, we're talking about mm-hmm. advertising, right? And so we, we just jumped into memories pretty quick. But the reason is so much of advertising is about memories, right? Yeah. It's about getting in front of people so that when they go to buy, and, and if you think about your own buying journey, the first thing that you do is you're going to enter the category. And once you've entered the category, then you're going to create a short list of options within the category. So Mm -hmm. for example, uh, our clients and customers are looking for help with marketing. Uh, Most of our revenue comes from our marketing agency services. So those folks enter the category by deciding I'm going to look into hiring a marketing agency. Yeah. Sometimes they, they are more specific. I am going to hire a marketing agency, right? Yeah. Then they go find a short list. Now, if they have four, which most of our uh, prospects, there are four people, there are four agencies that they're talking to. That means if they choose randomly, we've got a 25% chance of being chosen, right? So that means mm-hmm. our, our sales, our close rate should be at least 25%. If it's below yep. 25%, that means something's wrong, right? We're screwing it up yep. in the sales process. Yeah. But getting onto that list of four, that's the most important step here. That took mm-hmm. our chances of being chosen from zero to 25%. Mm-hmm. That is massive. And this is where those memories come in. If we've been building memories over time, when they enter that category and they say, I am going to hire a marketing agency, 
Yeah. We get to be one of that 25%. Or we get to be one and, of the four. And that means you know, we're, being we're likely those, gonna have a 25% those, close rate. Those sales calls as I have, it is it does come up often. Oh, you know, I was listening to the podcast. Oh, I was, you know, checking out uh, the website. Oh, I saw this uh, webinar that you were, you know, you were giving. So there there has been this touch point that so when they get to that buying consideration, they go, yeah. oh, you know, I should set a meeting with uh, with Claire Brand. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good idea. Um, Absolutely. At least one of the four, you know. And, right. And so and that's, that's where these memories do. come in. The memories are to get us yeah. on that short yeah. list. So I want to I want to if you if you if you're okay with it, I want to now unpack some of the science of how that happens, kind of neurologically in the brain. I've got a lot of interest in this area. Um, I've, I've got an extended family that has uh, had compulsive um, behavior issues. And, mm-hmm. and that comes from, you know, how, people make compulsive, even buying decisions, right? And it Absolutely. seems subjectively to be an act of will. I'm choosing this. But you're choosing from the options that popped up. And that is a result of these memory structures in the brain. So we're talking about building memories, but if we think about how the brain works as an, uh, as an electrical uh, network, electricity travels through the path of least resistance, mm-hmm. right? So you get to a point where I need to make a decision. It start, there's a firing of neurons and that spreads out into, you could call it a neural cloud. Mm-hmm. And the, the frequency and the, cohesion and the clarity of that cloud of information all of these different neurons and synapses in your brain that is what leads to oh i'll think of that brand right and Mm -hmm. so there's actually a process of of laying down what's called myelin myelin sheath along a neuron which makes it conduct electricity more which means that the electricity travels easier and as we're talking about survival, we're always looking to optimize energy use in the body. So this is a great scientific underpinning of the fact that if you have more associations to your brand, what it does, who, it, who it's for, and we'll talk about emotions as well, um, then when that moment comes up to think of a solution, what can I use to solve this problem? Your brand is going to come to mind because it is so yeah. embedded in understanding that problem and looking for a solution to it. So I love the fact that it's based in that science, which is Yeah, great. and then just a quick picture here of, uh, you know, we're getting into myelin sheaths. So this is a little bit more technical. Uh, just a picture <laughs> of what this looks like. MS, a big part of MS, so multiple sclerosis, is actually the breakdown of yeah. myelin sheaths. So this is the opposite of yeah. what we're going for here, right? People uh, losing motor skills and things like this. So with, as we're first off, I mean, hopefully a healthy body is going to have these strong myelin sheaths anyway, Mm -hmm. but we are in a sense, rewiring the brain or what you're talking about is also similar to habits. Yep. And I think that's, as we talk about kind of the myth of loyalty, that's a big part of loyalty is getting in the habit of Mm -hmm. buying something. Yep. Getting in the habit of thinking about something. And, you know, I think another angle of this, that again, we hear this spoken about in advertising that we need to be using emotional advertising and that correlates to mm-hmm. what we're seeing of people make emotional decisions when they are buying, yep. not necessarily a rational, you know, clean, clean cut decision. Um, and this is true in all of our lives. If I mm-hmm. ask you, you know, where were you on, you know, let's, let's talk about something that is deeply anchored September 11th. Where were right. you? you know where you were, you know what happened next. However, if I asked you, where were you three weeks after that on November the 17th? No idea. No clue. Because we were so emotionally charged in the moment on that day, we can, re- we can recollect it, right? So that's where the science of, of building memory structures in the brain aligns with this idea of emotional mm-hmm. marketing, that, that when your marketing makes your viewers or your prospects feel something and you have a unique brand that is represented in that advertising there's an association that is going to yes. build up a more integrated memory yeah and and so as we talk about emotions i mean a lot of folks jump to i can't do that you know we can't produce like videos or something i mean you can do mm-hmm. this in, in a lot of ways it's the yep. difference between you know focusing on the facts 
and trying to persuade, which research shows persuasive advertising is actually not very persuasive. Yeah. It doesn't get as good results as, as emotions. You know, so saying uh, something like the this uh, computer, for example, or this this uh, we could talk about Apple Watch or phone or whatever. It's got all of these technical specifications. Mm-hmm. If that was it, period, um, that's not very connecting, even if it is yeah. seemingly persuasive. But if we look at their their main parts of their marketing, right? So that's that's all there on their website for the folks who are curious and the people who want to explore. Sure. We don't want to remove that, right? We're not going to say we're, we're going to ignore that. What we want to do is add the emotions to that. So Apple has run ads for the iPhone in the past, you know, your new superpower. Look at all the things that you can accomplish now. Yeah. That's yeah. more emotional, right? Yeah. If we're talking about something like a seatbelt, we're going to want to not only talk about the technical specifications of this thing, but also stay safe for your family. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Things like that. Oh man, suddenly that's way more engaging yeah. to me. Yeah. You know, there's and, commercials and again, that it, I remember. It, or are you gonna yeah, say? I was just, I was just going to reiterate just how it, you know, it, it ties into a quick decision. Mm-hmm. Oh, is a, is a thousand pounds of, of pressure release on this belt? Is that good? Is that bad? Do I need to check another blog on whether that is good? Is this green rated? Hold on. Keep my kids safe. No, that I know that's important. Yeah. That is a no brainer. Right. right. And yeah. that's, that's where people talk about differentiation all the time. You can sell the exact same thing as your competitors. And if you're the one who's saying, keep your kids safe, and your competitors are just talking about the technical specifications, yeah. you're going to win. Like yeah. that's the best kind of differentiation. This clarity, you know, yeah. Apple was not the first one to have an MP3 player. Yep. But everybody else was talking about the MP3 player and the size and the specifications and Apple said a thousand songs in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Very different. Yeah. It reminds me of that scene in Mad Men, uh, the lucky strike client. Yeah. uh, Just being told that, you know, the regulations changed. They can't use their marketing slogans. And, and uh, the response from the Mad Men was it's roasted. It's it's toasted. It's toasted. It's toasted. There you go. Right. (laughs) And, And I remember in the scene, and the, uh, yeah. the the Lucky Strike executive said, "Everyone else's is toasted." Yeah. And you know John Hamm's character says, "No. Yeah. Everyone else's is poisonous. Yeah. Yours is toasted." Yeah. Yeah. So so in the messaging, super important. Yeah. Yeah, but that's even not if we're talking about emotions. That's not especially emotional, right? So that wouldn't necessarily be the exact uh, right principle here, but it is the right idea as far as differentiation right? Mm-hmm. Your messaging can be incredibly differentiated, even if your product might not be right. Apple music and Spotify are basically the same, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and we could still have these marketing pushes where yeah. we're talking about the yeah. emotions. Yeah. Right. Sure. The number 90 million songs or whatever they have, I'm never going to listen to 90 million songs. I don't care how many songs yeah. it has. Does it have yeah. the songs I want to listen to is the thing I'm curious yeah. about. Yeah. And so these, you know, okay, I think we've I think we've hit this emotion. Yeah, I want to I want to bring us enough. back to that to that buying moment, right? Yeah. And and I want to tie in this idea of how the brain builds mental memory, okay. well, memory structures. Yeah. And there's, there's there's a great example and and again, we're going we're going to look at this lens. We we're, we're using this lens to figure out what should we be doing in our advertising. That is that is why this is useful. We're not just talking about this theoretically. We want to know how it can be used. So if you take the example of a child's brain, let's say a five-year-old's brain, and you, you say the word house, they're going to think of a simple stick drawing that they drew recently at class for mommy and daddy, where mommy and daddy live or where we live. Now, if you, if you look at a brain that's much older than that, even let's say a 30-year-old brain, if you say the word house, now it has all these other associations, right? It's maybe the first house that they bought. Maybe there's mortgage and dealing with that. Maybe there's an image of the actual house that they bought or maybe a house where they got broken up with by a girlfriend or mm-hmm. um, a house that they built and repaired, different colors, their dream house. And so the reason that's important is that as advertisers, we can look at all the different ways in which we can add to this cloud. Mm-hmm. This neural 
network of associations to our brand. Where is it used? How is it used? What problem does it solve for this uh, category of concern? How can it also be applied in this area? And by doing that over a, and again, time is very important here because yeah. it takes time to build these these associations. And 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 uh, I know we're going to look at a case study in a moment. That once we've once we've built out this very comprehensive network of associations to our brand, then we've got all these customer entry points that we've spoken yep. about in the past as well, where people can then choose us. We have that mental availability we're in the mind so that any association that comes to making this decision to buy the solution to this problem I have can be hit right on all these different right. angles. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that that's a, you know, I've heard so much marketing these days about you have to be known for one thing, mm -hmm. but it's not true. Uh, you, you do want to have strong associations with these uses, but marketing research shows that bigger brands have more connections with more uses. And so, you know, we could call this multi-message marketing, or we could just say, let's build some connections with uses here. Mm -hmm. But we do not need to corner ourselves into one potential use. And I think that this is a big myth with uh, niches. People will yeah. talk about how Apple, when Steve Jobs came back, he got rid of all of the things that they were selling except for the computer. And people talk about that like a niche. And then they go and they talk about advertising and they say, you need to sell, pick your customer avatar. Mm -hmm. And you're going to figure out, oh, we're going to sell to financial advisors who are making between one and $5 million in annual revenue. These are two totally different things. So Apple choosing to sell one product is not the same at all as choosing to sell to one type of person. Yeah. Right. So what we want to make sure that we're doing is we have clarity around the thing that we're selling. And that's what we want our quote niche to be in is the thing mm -hmm. that we're selling. But as mm -hmm. far as who we're selling to or the potential uses, it's actually better to have more. We don't need to make our product or service be all things to all people. Yeah. But we can, I think a great example of this is teamwork.com. Uh, we don't actually use this. I've just been looking into competitors of Asana out of curiosity because we use Asana at Clearbrand. So teamwork.com is a project management app and they're doing a great job with this, right? It's one product. No matter why mm. you buy it, you are getting access to teamwork. Same product, right? Yeah. But if you go into their header, into the navigation bar, they have all sorts of uses listed there. Are you an agency? Are you a business? You know, And they have all these different possible people who might want teamwork. And then they have uses like time tracking. They have profit management. Somehow you can do that with teamwork. They have task management. And they're building these connections with uses. Now we have to do this intentionally. We don't want to start off with a thousand different uses because none of them are going to end up being strong enough, right? So we want to focus in on one or two or three, but over time, and this is the thing with marketing, it never ends. So over yeah. time, we're going to be expanding the uses. As yeah. long as you have competitors, you will need marketing. So yeah. you've got plenty of time. Yeah. And so we yeah. can start with a couple of uses with, with that clear message, and then we can start to add to it. So if you haven't been to Teamwork, go to teamwork.com, and I would look at their header, and you can see how they've done this. It's one thing that you're buying. Yeah, with and all, these, all these different uses. angles onto right. it so that you can see it from different angles right because we don't know who's buying yeah we don't know who our customers could be there's no way that we can know exactly right, right. and that's the issue with like picking something like oh we only sell to financial advisors making between one and five million in annual, annual revenue if somebody else wants to buy your product and it's the same product that you already sell why would you say no the yeah. only thing that you're doing is making yourself a smaller company than you could be. Yeah. This is this yeah. is the this is the massive problem with target audiences. Uh, target audiences really only need to exist if we have a limited budget. Mm -hmm. right? we're, we're targeting one group first because our budget's limited. Mm -hmm. But that has nothing to do with memories. Well, yeah, that, I was going to say, you know, I think that 
that use case has to be memorable, right? Again, yeah. so if we're talking about the way that we, we put the messaging into that building a use case, if it is, well, this uh, can work for, you know, frequencies between four, five, eight hertz and seven, eight, you know, we, we're right. gone. Because again, this is too much energy in the brain to try and make a decision. I'm not understanding this thing. I'm moving on. I'm out. And 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 if we can take it a step further that we can go, I'm understanding this thing. There we got mm-hmm. our kind of, our, our gray matter up in the front of our brain but i'm also feeling really good about this thing or i'm right you know it's just, it's reminding me of how nice it was to be at home and just you know have a have yep. a turkey that was available so quickly and you know it's going to be great so now yeah you know and case an example right now i said the word home and now i'm thinking of christmas and in south africa we we eat turkeys and christmas not on thanksgiving but okay. thanksgiving but yeah. um there you go. There's this association. So if we're tapping right. into that, at the same time as providing this use case that's clear, then we're building a much stronger association. Right. Um, yeah. At Clearbrand, we've been evaluating the what are people what are people calling marketing. Right? Yeah. So lead generation and inbound marketing are basically the same thing, but some people yeah. use the term lead generation and some people use the term inbound marketing. Now, lead generation mm-hmm. can include outbound activities, mm-hmm. cold calling and stuff could technically be lead generation, but most folks aren't thinking about it in those terms. They're, mm-hmm. they're kind of thinking about it all as marketing. So for us, we're like, why would we not have both? It's the same yeah. thing, right? Yeah. But now to bring this back together as far as the emotions, yeah, we could say we offer lead generation services. We offer inbound marketing services. We offer digital ads, right? We offer SEO. We offer content marketing and blogging. But that's just kind of facts. And while that's good and that's connecting with these uses, which we want to do, Mm -hmm. it's better if we say, increase your revenue Mm -hmm. with digital ads that convert, right? Accelerate your growth. Yeah. Gain that stability in your business. Yeah. That that consistent leads provide. Yeah. 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 Right. So this is where the emotion, and we can combine these ideas of the emotions on one hand, reaching the people who are not yet thinking about buying so that we can build those memories and then building connections so that however they're thinking about this thing, because we're going to do ads and SEO and blogging for basically everybody. Mm -hmm. And there's a dozen different ways that people talk about those things. Mm -hmm. So we want to have those connections. No, we're not going to, we're not going to suddenly start doing, let's say press releases just because somebody requests it. We're going to do the things that we're experts in. Yeah. But they might talk about ads in one way or another and marketing and inbound yeah. and content, all these things in one way or another. So we want these connections there. There's a, there's a, a company in Cape Town, just, uh, you know, I live in a small town outside of Cape Town, South Africa. And there's a guy called Mr. Chips. And he, okay. I think he's got a pretty big business. He, you know, he's got countless trucks driving around with these like, the cheapest chips you can imagine, deep fried, frozen to deep fried in 10 seconds, nothing wow. to do with health. Anyway, his advertising on the side of all of these trucks is a very badly printed, full life-size woman bikini holding a ball of chips, right? <laughs> and and we see this everywhere, right? I mean, this, this tactic has been used so many times. And it's again pointing to the fact that this is hijacking your brain because there is, you know, the need to... Uh, propagate the species and 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 right, you know, yeah, you're connecting. and and there is an emotional you know response here, and then there's an association to these chips, and I always thought it's so it's so, uh, but there is science behind it, right? That there that there is this association that happens. Obviously, that tactic has you know different implications. Um, but if I we mean, look Carl's even, Jr. used that tactic in the U.S. Mm-hmm. for years. I, I I haven't seen a Carl's Jr. ad in a while, so I don't know if they're still doing it. Uh, but for years, Carl's Jr. ads yeah. were just attractive women eating yeah. burgers. Yeah. And I think, you know, as we, as we learn more about how the brain works, that kind of blunt object has become a lot more refined. So, you know, some of the science that, that I'm quite interested in as well is, is mirror neurons, right? So if you're watching this on YouTube, if, you, if it's audio, you'll have to just imagine it. But if I, if I take my hand like this and I pretend to be drinking, if uh-huh. I did this for maybe another 30 seconds, your mouth as a viewer would start salivating really? because there are mirror neurons that fire in your brain 
as if you were doing what you're seeing me doing. That's why in advertising, you don't see, you know, in the, in the majority of cases, very sad people, right? These are people smiling, using a yeah. product that are having a great time. And our brain goes, wow, look, I can feel like that. I'm already feeling like that. When you watch a sad mm -hmm. movie, you feel sad. When you watch an action movie, you feel adrenaline. You know, so the emotional yeah. state that we're putting our, our viewers, our prospects in when they're associating to our unique brand, remember it has to be unique, that is building the strong connection to them in terms of a memory that they have, which we hope, well, yeah. we have a much better chance. Let's not talk about hope. Let's talk about the, the statistics, the chance of showing up in that buying moment. Uh, which I think is super interesting. Right. I mean, I think yeah. this is why companies like Old Spice and Geico spend so much time trying to make people laugh in their commercials. <laughs> and I mean, Old Spice does just ridiculous stuff in their commercials. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. But they have this, I'm, I'm thinking of one that's been out recently where it's kind of a spoof on, uh, I think it's Die Hard. And some guy's, you know, hanging off the a railing and somebody else is like reaching up to him, but he's sweating so much, you can't get a good grip <laughs> on his hand. You know, so I mean, it's yeah. hilarious, number one, but it's it's on brand and they show the old spice throughout the the yeah. commercial. Yeah. And that's the thing with this stuff, too, is you can't be afraid to show your brand because if you don't yeah. show your well, brand, you have to. You, it's you not have that you, to show your brand. You, you have. And, 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 and a counter example was the Miller Light campaign around the man laws. So right. you might not even remember it because the association, it, it, it did not do very right. man well. Man laws. Actually, yeah. Gained more traction than Miller Light did. And people thought it was a Bud advert. They thought it right. was a Bud Light advert because it was more aligned. And th and here's a great example of that, right? There's this there's this neural network, this this connection of associated memories and 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 feelings and messaging that is Bud Light, and mm -hmm. that exists in the brain. And then there's this other one, and Miller Light starts going a little bit too close to that other network right. using the man laws, and all of a sudden now the whole Bud Light neural your network is firing and that all that marketing spend is going straight to to bud light so right or nowhere you know, just to the just to the man yeah, 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 right yeah, yeah. yeah and this is you why know, we have to even if it's i mean we start with that uniqueness and recognizability will will this trigger a competitor's brand yeah we initially start there with the colors and the logo and the fonts even the message right the message yeah. there's messaging yeah. it's often hard to to be different with messaging because we're often selling things very similar to our competitors, but at the very mm -hmm. least, we, we know that we can be different with our, our, our branding and things. But then as we expand into videos and images, yeah. we can yeah. still accidentally trigger our competitors' memories. Yeah. And so we don't want to be doing that, right? If the yeah. whole point of advertising is to build up these, these memories, build up these connections, and we're going to be using things like recognizability and emotions to do that, man, we can shoot ourselves in the foot if, if we end up, even if it's creative like the man laws. Yeah. And it's not yeah. branded well enough and it's too yeah. close to a competitor. Yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. So there's no, there's no turning the brain off here. Right. Um, and that's what I love. That's what I love about these lenses that we've been exploring, the why behind the action. Mm -hmm. um, and some, some great things that we've touched on today. Fantastic, fantastic to be talking about these things and, and giving practical ways to look at how we can be then advertising. Yeah. So is there anything else you want to add in? Yeah, I'm sure that some folks are, you know, wondering, okay, well, how does this, how does it apply to Google or how does it apply to Facebook as far as advertising goes? So these principles we've discussed are going to apply anywhere that you're reaching people. I mean, even in, in the topic of availability, which we talked about last mm -hmm. week, everywhere that your brand is visible, we want these principles to apply. We want your brand to be unique and recognizable so that it's building memories with your brand. We want your advertising to be focused on the emotions. It doesn't mean we don't talk about something that's persuasive. It means that we also talk about the emotions and we're, we're focusing on the emotions rather mm -hmm. than the persuasion. The mm -hmm. emotions are going to end up performing better in our ads anyway. So this is going to mm -hmm. apply everywhere. You know, most of the availability is is having, you know, if, if you're in a store, you've got a little blurb on the side of your product. If you're on Amazon, you've got a little description section. If we're just talking about like a directory, you know, so Yelp or something, there's still a description section. So those are all areas where we're going to be leveraging, you know, the, the profile yeah. photo is going to be, we want it to be on brand. I mean, actually yeah. our logo, 
recognizable. The description to be focused on emotions, maybe if something's genuinely persuasive, we include that, but still pr the preference is on the emotion. So even though we didn't talk specifically about the Google ads or the billboards or the Facebook ads today, these principles, this is, this is more about how advertising works than your own personal strategy. You know, mm -hmm. so these principles yeah. we're going to want to use and apply wherever and however we're going about advertising. Well, thank you so much for the time. Great conversation. Yeah. Looking forward to, to the next one. Thanks for yeah. being here, Josh. Thanks for listening to the Clear Brand Academy podcast, where we take the mystery out of marketing and help you get more leads and sales with a clear brand and proven marketing tactics. If you liked this podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to outsource your marketing to our team, go to clearbrand.com.